Good morning, church. All right. I hope you're ready to get into God's word here. Well, today we close out our series on love God, love people. Today, the title of the lesson is Love God and Love People for Their Creations. I also want to uh, welcome Matt Lovachev is here visiting with us still. He's working to find a place to live, and uh, him and his wife will be moving here the last week of May. Yeah. And uh, he'll not only be leading uh, the North House Church, uh, but he's also leading CR for the region and for the entire L.A. Church. So it's great to have you here, bro. It's awesome. And uh, it's great to have our little Avery here visiting with us here today from, from the Central Region. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I know Miguel prayed for, that uh, I would be filled with rebukes, but I'm just not today. I, I do want to thank everyone that went out tagging. What an incredible thing, guys, that in three weeks we raised $6,000 out there tagging. That was a phenomenal thing. Thank you for giving your hearts and being such great examples. If you, uh, if you didn't get to go to one of the events, you really missed out on the spirit of what was happening. Because, I mean, you had people who were driving by, they saw everybody on the mic yelling, screaming, waving their signs, and they would go and turn around and come back and drive back because they were so impacted by what they saw. And uh, what an incredible heart that uh, we have in the people here in this region. I love you all very much. Amen. Genesis 1. Today I want you to be inspired. Amen. Today I want you to leave motivated. Because you have more control in your life than you know. Yeah. Think about what you have created in your life. Think about what God has created in your life. Those things are supposed to make you fall more in love with Him than ever. It's supposed to make you fall more in love with people than ever. And yet, uh, where does it all come from? Let's go to Genesis 1. Let's go back to the beginning, right? I have three points today. My first point is love God because of His creation. My second point will be love people because of their creations. And our third point will be, love yourself to create the life God intended for you. Yeah. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, just like our lives without Christ. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You know, before you came to know God, He was just hovering over there, just waiting for you to return to Him. And then God spoke. And God said, let there be light. You know, the most amazing thing happened here. It's so simple, it's shocking. God said, let there be light, and you know what happened? There was light. I say that because we so often don't expect God's Word to work. And yet, God's Word works. These were His words. And His words were, let there be light. So there was light. Seems like a little thing. But everything in our lives comes from it. It says, verse 4, God saw that the light was good. Well, that's because everything God creates is good. And he separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And we see the division of good and evil, light and darkness, night and day. And we know those metaphors carry all throughout the rest of Scripture. But isn't that amazing? What God says happens? You know, I don't know how it all worked, but I know why it worked. Because God is faithful. The reason why when God said, let there be light, that it happened was because there was nothing in existence to disobey Him. 
And yet God made man after this, and he decided to give man free will and the ability to choose to obey or disobey his words yeah. and test them on out to see if they work, you know? So, interesting thing is whether we say yes, I obey, or no, I don't, we create something ourselves. The most powerful thing to me in this passage right here is that where there is nothing, God creates something. And yet, that impacts our lives. Consider a person driving a car, running from the police. We see these police chases on the freeway, right? It's an amazing thing that we have this concept down. So the police chase is happening, everybody's watching it on TV, and everybody's like wondering what's gonna happen. Well, you already know what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen? The chase is gonna end, and what's gonna happen to the guy? It's gonna go to jail. Sometimes it's a woman too, but not very often. But we know, at the, is there anybody that's going to get an exception to that and not go to jail? No. And not get arrested? Can you imagine them just letting them go? No. And yet, God's Word makes all these incredible promises about what happens when we obey, and also what happens when we disobey, and it's like our car chase. And we get to the end of it, and we think like we're going to get away with disobeying. <laughs> we understand it with a car chase, but then for some reason, we don't understand it with obeying God's Word. You know, men write down laws and they recite those laws so that we know if we go down the path and we obey all the laws, then we're not going to get in trouble and we won't get put in jail and we won't get fined. And yet, if we break the law it, with men, it doesn't, does it matter if you've read all the statutes? I mean, do you, how many have read all the statutes of all the laws just in the state of California, let alone the United States? But if you break them, you go to jail. And yet, somehow we, we think, oh, well, I haven't read the whole Bible, so I'm not accountable for it yet. Yeah, we are. Because we're made in God's image. And men handle law like, somewhat like God handles his laws. We're held to these laws whether we read them or not. Because we're made in his image. You know, God creates a picture through his word, or his Bible, right? Of what life is supposed to look like. And he gives us these beautiful illustrations of when people obey him and how awesome it is and victory and everyone's blown away by God's people. And then he gives us pictures of stories of people that disobeyed, people that ran from him and what happens in their lives. And it's interesting, God creates a picture of, you know, things like pornography and immorality. They're in the Bible. Bitterness is in the Bible. Lying is in the Bible. But God talks about all these things and how they play into our lives. He, he also gives us a picture of things like sharing our faith with each other, encouraging each other, lifting each other up, building each other up, and what life looks like when we live that way. What we do is we focus on how tempting it is to stay away from sin. And we just talk it up and talk it up and, 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 and we well up and oh, oh, it's so hard to stay away from this. It's so hard not to punch somebody in the face today. And, and you, know, you know, if you talk about that long enough, what you end up doing? Because when we're talking, we're creating something because we're made in His image. And then we miss the boat. And we, we steal our own strength to be able to obey God. You know, uh, growing up, we and maybe our parents ruined our relationship with each other. And life, depending, depending on how you respond to it, makes you rebellious, destitute, or maybe hopeful. And yet, you know, it's an interesting thing. We have a lot of singles in the house here, right? Singles? I haven't met any of you that doesn't want to get married at some point. And, and yet, if you understand the promises surrounding marriage and relationships, if you understand the promise of what happens if you're immoral, you won't do it. If you understand what it will do to your marriage later, you won't do it now. Yet, we don't read the promises. 
And we don't and we forget about the promises of God. Go to Isaiah chapter 55. This is a passage that we read in the very first lesson in this series. And the passage really conveyed to us that God's ways are not our ways. And how much higher His ways are, are than ours. And so we're going to pick up right at the end of where we left off there. And we left off in verse 9. And consider that, my ways are not your ways. That's when His words are not our words. And His words create. In verse 10 it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it blood and bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. God says, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Right here, he gives us a choice. He says, my ways are better than yours, and my words are better than yours. And he says, so you should use them. How do we know he's conveying that? Because what he continues on in verse 12. If you use them, he says, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Anybody want some joy and peace in their life this morning? And the mountains will burst into song for you. And all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow a pine tree. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. I guess myrtle's pretty awesome then. This will be for the Lord's renown. That's you. An everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. That's what it means to be one of God's people today. Wow. If you use his words, your, wife, your life doesn't have to be empty anymore. You know, everything God created is for you. I mean, look at the person next to you. It's not for them, it's for you. But between them and the Lord, it's for them. Like, you got to understand something. We don't love people this way. We talk about love God, love people. But see, God has the ability to love each and every one of us like we're the only one on the planet. Everything He created through His Word, was for you. And He says, all the hills, they're going to clap for you. They're going to sing for you. It's all for you. Love God. Because He's giving you something that you can bet on. You know, we talk about making investments and, you know... Uh, it was funny, I sold my car for special missions, and, and uh, it went in like an hour. You know, I was kind of hoping that it wouldn't sell. <laughs> I loved my truck, man. And as a sign, I loved it a little too much, so hey, man, put it out there, an hour, boom, gone. Okay, I guess I needed to get rid of it. And, and yet, the poor kid that bought it totaled it two days ago. Just like, wow. It seemed like such a great buy. And now it's gone. You go, wow, man. But you know what? It's an amazing thing. We, we, we pick to invest our money in certain things that just get taken from us. And we go, wow, that wasn't a good investment. And yet God's word is always a good investment. God's word always yields the return it's supposed to. And it always creates for our lives what it's supposed to create. Love God because of his creation. Secondly, love people because of their creations. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. Bless you. You know, from time to time, we all struggle in our faith. And you hear some people just like, well, you know, I think I might go check out another church. Well, I got news for you. There is no other church. There's only one, and it's from the Bible. 
And that church is right here. It doesn't say anything about any other churches, but this is God's church for sure. And so, so you'll leave God's church to go find God's church. Hmm. That sounds like an attitude with people to me. Um, but we get this thing like, what advantage is there to be a disciple or to be a part of this church or another church? Well, you know, God has something to say about that in Romans. Romans 3 verse 1. What advantage then is there to being a Jew or what value in circumcision? Now, you know, you know when there's an exclamation point, right? It means something, right? And he's like, you know, okay, what advantage is there being a Jew or, or, or being a Gentile? You know? He goes, much in every way. It's a big deal, actually. First of all, this is believers. They have been entrusted with the very words of God. Wow. Whoa! That's pretty awesome. I don't know about you, but I go, wow, God trusts me? <laughs> Woo! That's crazy. He's definitely merciful. <laughs> when you think about it, okay, God's words create. Think about what, it, what God's words created. Okay, nothing small, just our earth, water, sky, <laughs> light, darkness, animals, vegetation, man, woman, love, hatred. You know, I mean, God just created all this. And you go, so he created the, you know, the, the, Holy, the, the Holy Spirit, the whole concept of the Holy Spirit living in us, he created. Like, that's crazy. That you could be a vessel that God can live in. Amen. You're a temple. Like, wow. wow. Like, that's just blow away. But then, okay, if his words created all of that, and he trusts you with his word, that means he trusts that you're going to do with his word what you're supposed to do with yeah. it. Wow. So... Not only do God's words create, but he trusts you to speak them so that you then create. So if God's words create, right? And we speak the Lord's words that we're supposed to speak at the right moment at the right time. What will that create? Wow. What can that create? Does any situation seem too tough when you really understand that? What that means then is the outcome of your life and mine is de not determined by what happens to us, but rather what we create given the scenarios that are before us. Amen. Amen. I know some of you aren't as fired up about that because now you're responsible. And we love responsibility, don't we? But yet, consider this. People create awesome things. I left my cell phone in my bag, but I have an incredible cell phone. Yeah. You know, God didn't just say, let there be cell phone. And there was cell phone. <laughs> he let man create that. Yeah. He didn't just say, let there be pews. Some man actually created these pews. Some man created this building. An incredible place for us to be able to worship. Are you not grateful that we have this place? Yeah. People create incredible, phenomenal things. I mean, you look at these, these tallest buildings in the world. and You know, some of these mansions that are created, they're like phenomenal, man. Yeah. Great. The landscaping and all, all the stuff. And yet, it pales in comparison to what God creates. But man is so creative and intuitive and because he's made in the image of God. We all want to create like God creates. And so, but we can also create chaos. I don't know if you've ever created chaos. I've created some in my lifetime. I used to sit behind, I used to, I used to live in Anaheim off of Euclid Avenue in Cerritos. It's just three blocks from Disneyland, and so there's like tons of traffic going down Euclid Avenue all the time. And um, we had a little kumquat tree in the backyard. And I'm going to confess, all right, so I, I used to sit back there and take the kumquats and throw them over the wall. Cars going by. There was like a little market across, and I used to throw them all the way into the store and duck down. 
create chaos, you know? <laughs> and then God's words are true. You know, there, there's discipline. And God says, spare, don't spare the rod. So my dad didn't. And it was, amen. I stopped throwing kumquats. <laughs> But you consider it's our choice what we create. Yeah. Gosh, man, sky's the limit for you today. Yeah. What are you going to create? What are you going to create with all that God's done for you? Yeah. Colossians 3, 9, and 10 teaches us that every day we're to put on a new self. Yeah. And it's interesting. How do you put on the new self? By listening to God's word and doing what it says. And it creates a new person. It creates a new way of thinking. It creates a new way of feeling. You don't have to be stuck anymore. 1 Peter 4.11 says, If we speak, anyone who speaks should speak as if he's speaking the very words of God. And yet we're entrusted to do that. Romans 3.1-2 says. And yet so often... We sit down before somebody having a problem or, I mean, imagine this. God takes a person, right? Spends their entire lifetime getting them all prepared to come back to him and return to him. And he goes, I'm going to pick you and put you right in front of them. I trust you with my words. And you go, you know, my church is pretty cool. We got a great kids kingdom. You know, uh, we got a great singles ministry and, and this building we're at is pretty cool. You know, it's awesome. But you don't share your faith with them. Like God trusts you. And he prepares people their entire lives to put you right in their path. So that you can share what his words have created in your life. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. The less we are in our Bibles, the more we speak our own words. And consider this, whether good or bad, you create. See, it's a funny thing as a preacher... Like, I, I don't have to, like, rebuke you. I don't have to be like, and you need to repent! I don't need to do that. Because, you know, if you're being impure and I read a scripture on impurity, you're convicted. I don't need to... I just need to read the scripture, and it does its thing, you know? Now I hit my funny bone. My hand's numb. That's pretty cool. I want you to be inspired and encouraged and motivated to do the things that make your life awesome because that's what God wants for you. You know, we create, we can create a dynamic, inviting, loving experience for everyone that comes in contact with us. Or we can create a harsh, critical, tense feeling around us. But we can also create miracles because that's what God's word does. Think about this. We'll go to Ephesians 4.22. But I want you to consider your prayers. And I'm going to state this just bluntly because it's always true. You need to pray more and more deeply. You do. Yeah. Not the person next to you. Don't be going, oh, yeah, that one was good for Julie Saunders. She needed that. No, no. It's for you. Yeah. It's for me because we can all pray deeper and harder always because we're not Jesus and we never will be. <laughs> but your prayers create. Wow. In fact, there's virtually nothing more powerful that you can do for your own life than to have a great prayer life. That's why after this series, I'm starting uh, the prayer series. Amen. And we're going to cover over four lessons, Luke 11, 1 through 4, and talk about how we're supposed to pray every day. Ephesians 4, verse 22. Your prayers create. Your counseling with one another creates. But also your responses to the hardships in your life and the bad things people do and say to you create something as well. Verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Well, doggone it, if you're still responding the same way to people when they hurt you, you haven't put off the old self yet. It's an amazing thing. 
put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Oh my gosh, even as a disciple, you can be corrupted? Yes. Yes. In fact, you can be corrupted while you're sitting right here, right now in church, if you so choose. You were called to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Think about that statement. In your mind, you have an attitude. And it's a good one or a bad one. And you're to be made new in that attitude. It's the one that nobody sees. It's the one where all those little sharp comments and critical statements and all that stuff happen in your head that you don't say and you hope you don't say. Because you go, if I say that, everybody's going to hate me. But... You, God's word, when you put it on each morning, creates a new attitude. Wow. You don't like being here? Create a new attitude and you'll love it. Yeah. You don't like your discipler? Create a new attitude and learn what they have to teach you and then God will give you someone else later. <laughs> he goes on to say... And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He goes on to say, therefore, each of you must put off, what? Falsehood. You know, you know how you know you're stuck in that? Well, what I was going to say was, Ugh, but you didn't. You ever been there? I've been there. <laughs> Talking to myself, you know. We try and decide the right timing for everything. Yeah. Instead of just try, just deciding the right way to say it. Amen. You know, God affords you the ability to respond to anything, to say anything, to anyone at any time within the framework of His Word. Yeah. So you're not hindered in any way. So, so often we feel so hindered, like, okay, I do not like what was just said or what was just done, but I can't say anything about it. Yeah, you can. You just got to do it within the framework of the Bible. You can say everything you feel, everything you think, and be godly in doing it. And the first is just put off falsehood and speak truthfully. And then he's going to teach us here the rest of it. He says, for we are all members of how many bodies? One body. Now, here's the tough part, right? This is why we don't, this is really the reason why we don't say what we need to say in the moment, because we get angry and we don't want to let it go. Yeah. We call it hurt, but we go from hurt to angry in about half a second. Yeah. Guys never say, guys never go, well, I'm, no, I'm not hurt. I'm just angry. You're angry because you were hurt. You just, you went there so fast, you, you thought you bypassed it, but you didn't. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We go, okay, so that means you can be angry and not be in sin. Yeah. It's okay. You can be angry. Let me tell you, when, God looked, when Jesus looked at stubborn hearts, the Bible says he was angry and distressed. Yeah. And he wasn't in sin. Right. He made a whip out of cords and drove everybody out of temple courts, and, and yelling and screaming like a maniac, and he wasn't in sin. Wow. Don't try that. <laughs> Don't try that. I don't want any whips coming through the door. But there's the concept that y you are afforded to be angry about stuff. Yeah. There's things that happen that it's just not okay, and you should be angry. And that's okay. Just don't act out in sin. Yeah. Don't speak out in sin. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Well, that's pretty cool. God gives us a, a whole, I mean, he gives us like some, some room to be angry here. To, okay, so tonight, if you're angry about something, you got till sundown. God is merciful. He's a good God. Yeah. You wait. To, hey, you know what? Tomorrow morning you're still angry. You're in sin. Don't blame nobody. Because God's word. I mean, I mean, just put it away. Because God said so. Not because you understand it. Just let it go. Here, so, for me personally, I'm approaching. Uh, I'm 45 years old. I've been a disciple 23 years. So I've now approached that point in my life where I've been a disciple longer than I wasn't a disciple. And here's what I've learned in 23 years. Okay, I'm going to sum it all up. And I've learned a lot of things, but this is a huge one. So in 23 years, here's what I learned. I have a wicked heart. I have a wicked heart. The longer, I've come, the longer I'm around, the more wicked I see my heart is. And the more I see my need to control my mouth, which I actually can't do. 
but to control my mouth, we'll read in the last point how to how to control your mouth. Um, but I get angry a lot. You know that older men struggle with being angry a lot. You know. <laughs> I know R.D. doesn't struggle with being angry a lot, but he's like the exception to all the guys, you know? He doesn't, he just doesn't get angry for some reason, but. <laughs> but here's why in verse 27. Very serious. And do not give the devil a foothold. You stay angry, you give the devil a foothold, not the person that wronged you. You're back to that responsibility. It gets quiet when we have to be responsible for it. You know? it's, just, it's just tough. Being a disciple is tough, man. He who has been stealing must steal no longer. Okay, don't steal. All right, no dipping your hand and the plate goes by. None no of that stuff. But must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Now, here it comes. Okay, now, this is tough, right? This passage is really tough. We read over it quickly, but it's really tough. I don't know, maybe it's only tough for me, but... Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Oh, dang it, why'd you have to put that one in there? What in the world? Hmm. Okay, is he, maybe I can make it a suggestion. No, it's a command. It's a command. Don't let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth. Man. So, I've got, so of course, that would include complaining. You know what's funny? I hear people, somebody cusses, and, so, and this is the passage that gets pulled out. I mean, somebody complains, and you go, you know what? You're right about that complaint. Like, like no, it's, it's about what's wholesome. Now, now, okay, he wants to make, or God wants to make sure that he creates in us the right heart so that we're not confused. So he says right here, he clarifies, but only, right? So some of us might not talk for about a week here. <laughs> Amen. So nothing unwholesome, but only, right? What is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it'll benefit who listens. Ah, oh, dang. We just go home. <laughs> just go home now. <laughs> like, like, you got to really seriously think about this because we violate this like daily. And we're all sinful, so we're all in the same boat with it. No one's ever perfect in what they say or do. So, but we're talking about creation today. Every time you violate it, you create something bad in your life. So, the thing about this passage is this like the kicker. It's just like the dagger. Like there wasn't already a dagger, right? Is that it's what's helpful for the other person so they get to say if it's helpful or not. Because you think being right doesn't necessarily make you right. Because if you pushing your will and what you know is right in their face doesn't help them, then you violated the scripture still. It's, it's, it's caring enough that you will give and take in the conversation so that this thing that you're so right about actually gets through to the person so they understand it and it's helpful and it builds them up. If it's not that, then it should not come out of our mouth at all. Take it up with the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, thank the Lord he gives us the practicals here of how to keep away from this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Woo. So we enter into our relationships. So that means we enter into our relationships ready to forgive whatever is going to be done to us. Pre-made forgiveness. Because that's how God forgave you. He was already ready. He already did it. He already decided. You sinned. He died. But he died 2,000 years before you sinned. And he forgave you 2,000 years ago. 
long before it happened. And we want to see people change and do what's right before we forgive. And that's just not the way God did it. Be kind and compassionate. Here's the thing, like, I don't know if any of you had anyone just wrong you recently. Or hurt you or say something bad to you. Well, it's an interesting thing, this concept of forgiving the way God forgave. But I'll tell you what helps me, okay? Here's what helps me. Because inevitably, you know, Sunday mornings, I'm like all geared up in my mind. I got my scriptures. I got my notes, blah, blah. I go, I go by about half the notes and then just wing it. And no, I don't. I'm always right through my notes. But inevitably, everybody wants to talk about their problems right before I preach. Bro, can I talk to you? Yeah, yeah is it bad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or people get attitudes with each other like right beforehand, you know what I mean? And, and then, we re then there's an overreaction and all this stuff. Well, what helps me is knowing what I deserve. So I'm God's child, so he wants the best for me. So there's a difference between what I deserve and what is, you know, God wants the best for me. So if Jesus died for us, then, is, then we deserved that, right? He got our punishment, right? So what did he get? What was that death? See, it's not just, it's, I, I deserve death. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin are death, right? So that means that I deserve to be arrested, be falsely accused, be betrayed by all my friends, have them totally desert me, have everyone say false things about me, be beaten all night long to a pulp until I can't stand. Um, then be beaten some more, have a crown shoved in there, blood everywhere, have the, have the whole thing ripped off my back like a band-aid. You know, I, that's, I deserve all that. And then after all night long, you know, like if we have to pray all night long, it's like the end of the world. Like, oh my gosh. Then be, then be mocked before an entire city and walked down a street in shame. For something I didn't do. And then have people pushing on me and shoving me and just be pushed to the point where I can't even stand anymore. Where someone else has to hold me up and walk with me so I can make it to die. And then, you know, if suffocating to death wasn't enough. Uh, or having the, all the fluid build up and crush my heart then just stick a spear in my side you know and then try and throw me in a hole thank God for the older guys they went and got his body they had been thrown off the pit with all the others see what helps me is that if I don't get that then I can take whatever happened to me if you yell at me and scream at me and treat me wrong or say false things about me I deserve worse and that's what when I am settled, because none of us are perfect, that's what settles me is that understanding. We, we should have a lot more grace with each other yeah. and not react towards each other so much. But be ready to forgive like God forgave. Amen. I want to talk about the concept of our new life that we're supposed to put on. Like I said, I've been a disciple 23 years. And, uh, you know, we had a night of atonement yeah. a couple weeks ago. Was that not awesome to get open with each other and share with each other? And yet I, I can't help but, because, you know, we're the kind of ministers that are actually involved with people and speak to people on a daily basis and whatnot. Yeah. I can't help but just sense that there's some of you who are still stuck. And not choosing to obey God's word in repentance because this room would have been filled like this at 10 o'clock if that was taking place. And the singing would just be like off the charts, raising the roof on this house because repentance brings refreshing. And, and so I just can't help but sense that you need some encouragement. Um, so I'm going to share about my life. Uh, again here. I was baptized in 1993. And, and you know, the first two years were phenomenal. Uh, I mean, literally, like, for a young guy that's 22 years old, I didn't lust. 
I didn't do anything impure. Uh, you know, I kept myself clean and righteous. And, and, you know, I was one of those young, dumb guys running around. Woo! Yeah, it's great to be inside. Hey, bro, what's up? Yeah. I was the guy that was like, no, 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 no. Everyone's like, calm down, bro. Calm down. It's okay, you know. And, and I was just fired up to be a disciple, young, dumb, and, you know, zeal without knowledge. Just like, yes. And, and church was like a drug almost, you know, and, and uh, there, was not, there was no reverence. There was no reverence to make sure I was on time. There, there was no reverence like when it comes time to take communion and, and you know, I, we were so, this is how young and dumb we were. If one of my buddies, there's five of us in the Bible talk that I was in. If one of us was up doing something in the service, like the others would be standing up in the back on the chairs going, you know, messing with them. Like, that's how irreverent. Just young and dumb. And, uh, and, and so you suffer when you don't take God seriously. You suffer when there's not a reverence in your worship. And... And I want to call us to a place of real worship that eliminates all hype. Where it's pure zeal the way God intended for it to be. It'll be better than we've ever seen. Um, but you know, it all came crashing down two years into being a disciple. I, uh, you know, I was, I was dating a sister at the time and um, things seemed to be going well and and, and, you know, it just, for me, it just seemed to come out of the blue. It doesn't come out of the blue, but it just seemed to come out of the blue for me is what it felt like. I was driving down the street, and I just got this overwhelming urge that, uh, of impurity. And I pulled my car over, went behind a building, and was impure. And, um, man, I, first thing I did, I, I called my leader. I was like, bro, I just sinned. And he says, Wow. And, you know, I'm going to set a tone for the church here. I masturbated. Okay, I'm, we say the word as brothers with each other. Don't minimize it to impurity. Be specific about what you did. Um, and I called my leader and I was like, bro, I just sinned. And he was like, oh, wow, okay. When's the last time this happened? And I said, this is the first time it's in two years? Yeah, it's the first time. He's like, oh, just don't do it again. <laughs> What? No, what are you talking about? Whip me or rebuke me or something. <laughs> you know, it was just that simple. Yeah. And yet I let his response tweak my heart. I felt like he didn't take me seriously. Like, and uh, that was my fault. What I chose to create in my response of all that was, to my shame, for 10 years I struggled with impurity and masturbation and pornography. From, 2000, from 1995 to 2005. That's, long, that's years into my marriage. And, uh, you know, even as disciples, we can let sin just destroy everything God's creating in us. And uh, impurity, pornography, anger, bitterness, being independent. I mean, you don't have to suffer like that. Yeah. And if you are today, please just confess and repent and yeah. get yourself out of it. There is a better path, and it's obeying God's word. And you'll, yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll be more refreshed than you've ever been if you get everything out yeah. and put it away and move on. Yeah. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can do that today. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And you know, for me, it, it came at a time, that my time of finally getting it and repenting came right when our churches were falling apart. You know, I'd been a member of the church here in L.A. for uh, since 1993, and here it was, 2005, and we didn't have D times anymore. I remember going into midweek service and had the lesson, and we broke up into D groups afterwards, and for me, that was where we, like, went and, hey, here's what's going on in the week, confess my sin, and, you know, I sat in the D group, and I was like, hey, guys, I got to confess, man. They're like, uh, we don't do that here. Well, what do you do? We just 
hang out and talk. I need to get clean. Well, there was a lack of understanding that I could just go to God and be clean. <laughs> I have the Holy Spirit in me. And I was too dependent on other people for my spirituality. Um, but, you know, what I did is, uh, you all are familiar with the light and darkness study that we do, right? You go through all, you know, sins of commission, sins of omission, all the stuff. And I just said, you know what, I'm just going to study the Bible with myself all over again. I whipped out my first principles book and took myself through the studies. Do you know that's the heart of how we got the first principles app? Was so that you could do that with yourself at any point in time. Um, I, I did a sin list. And uh, I typed it all out, and I typed it out single space, little letters, and I had 13 pages of sin typed out, front and back. And, and you know what hit me? In a, any given week, you take a page typed out, like, I have more than that amount of sin in a week, I don't know about you. But for an entire year, 13 years of being a disciple, I could only come up with a page a year. Because the longer you go in sin, the more you, sin you forget about you committed that you never confess. And it just creates havoc in your heart. And I, I you know, I made that sin list out and I, I sent it to four brothers that I really wanted help from. Our church was doing so bad, nobody even responded to me. Even when I went and asked them, I said, I don't have anything to do with talking about all that stuff with you. Wow. No care, no love, nothing. But you know what I had? I had my relationship with God. Amen. And I put all that stuff away. I confessed all my sin to the Lord. I confessed it to the brothers. It doesn't matter if there's a response or not. Yeah. My God forgave me. Amen. And I moved on. Yeah. And it was that next year that we started this church. Because it was time to have a church where people could confess their sin in a safe place and get help and repent and move forward to have great lives. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, some of us are hurting in our faith. And yet God says to you here, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. Yeah. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Yeah. You notice it doesn't say faith comes through the word of Christ. It comes through the message that is in the word of Christ. Yeah. And some of us just need to take ourselves back to the basics. Back to what created you. Created your life as a disciple. That understanding of God dying for you. Sending his son down. His son being tortured in the way that you should have been tortured. So that you don't have to be and can move on to a great life. Faith comes from understanding that message. And it's in the word of God. And so we've got to spend more time in our scriptures. In the Bible. Make more time in the morning. Spend more time in the evenings. Spend time with your God and love Him with all of your heart. Because He wants nothing but the best for you. You know, we, we, we talk about people that we think are a little hard-headed and we say, Oh yeah, with you it's your way or the highway. It's funny. God's plans for us are so much greater than our own. He wants everything you want for you, but He wants even more. And we get into this place with the Lord that... We want what we want, no more, no less. And because His is more, we go, uh, you didn't give me what I wanted. And really, it can become in our relationship with God, your way or the highway with the Lord. And it's a really dangerous place to be in when you're so stuck on what you want that you don't go to His Word and get encouragement the way you're supposed to every day. He moves on here to say, but I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voices have gone into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Wouldn't that be cool that God says that about you? Yeah. He says, I give you my word. It creates. It changes everything. It molds. It shapes. And I trust you with it. And if you use it, your voice will go to the ends of the earth. Let's be the church that God desires for us to be. And let's let our words go to the end of the earth out of the purity of our hearts. <laughs> Lastly, love yourself enough to create the life God planned for you. Go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. 
we forget that we're the temple of the living God. And we're supposed to love one another. The Bible says the greatest commandments, right? Love God, love people. And you're supposed to love them like you love yourself. Wow. But many of us don't love ourselves. So we can't obey the passage until we learn to love the temple of God. Luke 6, verse 43. I'm in John. No wonder. Where does everything you create come from? Verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Woo! Boy, if there's ever a passage to make us feel the responsibility of our own lives, it's this one right here. Okay, so wow. So if your words create just like God's words create, and out of the overflow of your heart is what you say, then what you store in your heart dictates the outcome of your life. And so thus we have to conclude, what are you storing in your heart today? What is it? Is it anger? Is it rage? Is it bitterness? Or is it awe? Because you read God's word and you believe it. Is it joy because you're away from the lifestyle you used to have? Is it peace because you know that your God forgave you 2,000 years ago and will forgive you now? Whatever you store determines what you say and what you do and how you respond to people. I, I come to find this is probably the most challenging piece because we try and control what comes out of our mouth. Boy, we try and lock it down. Oh, I can't say that. No, nope, no, nope, I can't do that. No, nope, can't say it. Right. No, you can't stop it. Whatever's in there will come out. Just because you don't let it come out publicly doesn't mean it doesn't come out privately. And doesn't mean little birdies don't go around and tell what you said. It comes out. Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. <laughs> In my 23 years, if I compare being a disciple to, have, to, to be in a boat, we, start, we all start out with a, little, with a little fishing boat. Sometimes you can catch fish that's too big to put in your boat. And then your ship grows over the years and gets bigger and bigger get to be about 10 years old it's like a yacht like, yeah the kingdom is awesome it's molded me it shaped me i'm a better employee i make more money at my job people trust me more i don't complain i don't gripe at the job you know i got a great relationship we, we're pure we're righteous it's awesome and then you know and then you get older and then it's kind of like one of those cruise liners everybody's like vacation on your house all the time because you've benefited from the kingdom for so many years. And yet, that cruise liner can just get off course. Yeah. And you know what takes it off course? Your tongue. But your tongue just says what's in your heart. No matter what you try. No matter what you try, you can't lie. It's coming out. James 3, verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my dear brothers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I love that passage. Come up here and preach each week and, you know, the day of judgment comes, we all get in line and we all get judged. This mind's more strict. Yeah. Love my role. It's awesome. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man. Able to keep his whole body in check. 
when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Sometimes that describes like D times, like put that bit in there, get it in there, obey. That's not what D time is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be helpful for building others up according to their needs. Speaking the truth in love. The expectation of obedience with the understanding that you don't obey everything either. Okay. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the captain wants to go. Wow. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on a fire by a small spark. Oh, baby, that little thing you wanted to share in private that gets out is a little small spark that starts a fire in your ministry. We think people are totally, like, totally confidential, but they're not. No. We're not. And we can't hold sin inside us very long. So when what comes out of you to someone is sin, it's going to come out of them eventually. It says, the tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now here it comes. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea have been tamed. <laughs> you see lions tamed? Whales tamed? It says, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, yeah. full of deadly poison. You know, then it goes on, it says another, a few other things here, but verse 13, I think, is the important piece for us. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. We deny it, though. I'm not bitter. <laughs> we deny what's in our hearts all the time. Yeah. You know what the biggest lie a Christian says is? The biggest lie. I hear it all the time. Hey, bro, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. That's the biggest lie. That's the biggest one we tell is we say we're fine when we're not. Because we won't be wholesome in the way we say how we're doing. And so we say nothing and we just keep all that poison inside of our heart. And then it wells up and it builds up and it builds up. And just the right moment, somebody says something and then. And then they're like, oh, is that it? No. And it just all comes out. And you're like, what? And the person's like, what in the world just happened? It's like all that stuff you were storing up it just came out. And that's our role in each other's lives. You know, and just be grateful for the kingdom, man. Like, wow. I mean, at least they have to forgive you. It's the kingdom, you know. It says in verse 17, but the wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Now there's a scripture on how to respond to somebody right there. Your ship may be off course today. You know, maybe you're visiting. And uh, y your relationship with God is just not on strict. You know, I, I want to urge you today to, to get with the person that brought you. Yep. Find out more about the Bible studies that we do here. And yeah. find out what caused the person that invited you to even want to invite you. Yeah. And study the Bible. Yeah. And get your relationship with God on straight. Yeah. If you're a disciple and you've just been drifting or stuck in sin, just... Be, be so grateful that God can live in you and that you have the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of His Word in your life. Make the decision today to turn away and never turn back.
Stop believing Satan's lies and start filling your heart with the truth. Suck up every promise in every scripture that you read. Love yourself enough to create the life God wants for you. Today, love God for His creation. Love people for their creation. But by God, love yourself. Love the temple of the living God. Out of the overflow of your love for God and your love for people, I challenge you today to create with your words in your life the exact life God has always envisioned for you since the beginning of time. I love you very much. Have an incredible day today.